Welcome back to a very British space program. This is episode 14, and we have decided to cast our eyes a little further. Um, we're going to go to the moon um, because, well, nobody else has been there yet, and um, the Earth's getting a little crowded. It seems the USA have uh, joined us in uh, in orbit with their Explorer 1, although they had to resort to getting some Germans to build it for them. So we're not entirely sure that's sporting, but they do seem to have claimed something called the Van Allen Belt. Anyway, let's get going. So you see us just upgrading our facilities because we've got a load of money after taking our lunar orbiting and contra impacting and flyby contracts. So we're rating things up and you are about to see the, the summation of that intense work. And this is the Trident 1A booster. And at the top there, you can see a Red Maiden 6A. It's a, it's a little uprated Red Maiden stage at the top. We're still using it. Looks very odd, doesn't it? Um, for context, the Trident is using uh, RZ-1 engines. These were developed for use in the, in, in your timeline uh, with the, the Blue Streak missile, and there would normally be two of them. We have got three. We've got one core one and two strap-on boosters, and uh, it's very similar to a strap-on system that was actually proposed for the, um, the Blue Streak missile, but they were actually going to use two sets of boosters with two engines each and things like that so it's actually it's actually half of what was proposed anyway it takes off and these these engines are very similar to the lr 79s uh, or actually the the s3s s3 and s3ds i believe they are and um so yeah so this is this is our our new big booster the trident 1b and this is uh, interesting because yes the first stage is basically ha three halves of a, a blue streak but the second and third stage is well let me say this it's got eight gamma engines and then it's got two gamma engines which which would make it pretty much a black arrow but we've put half or one and a half blue streak missiles underneath and interestingly this was a proposal that was put forward many many years ago so it's not entirely unrealistic um, apart from the side boosters coming off but there is this precedent for this so it's, it's actually quite nice to finally be flying something that is in effect got a bit of black arrow to it you can see we staged the side boosters a little early there and they went a bit crazy could have destroyed the craft need to work on that in future but you know it went off okay um, obviously all three engines light on the ground the two side boosters there just to give us the punch because at the moment this craft is actually quite heavy and that single engine cannot get it off the ground we could have gone dual engine in the middle but i played around and that's what we've got so here we go now we're firing what is in effect the first stage of the black arrow um, i haven't named it we're just considering it to be part of the tri the trident booster um and uh, the, the aim for this mission, I should say, is to uh, to go to the moon. We're going to try and get into orbit of the moon. And if we fail to get into the orbit of the moon, hopefully we'll hit the moon. Um, it's uh, It's been a nice sort of climb up through the atmosphere. And you can see we're now out of the, the thick stuff and we're preparing. And we've got, we're, this is our first sort of attempt with this booster stage. So we're actually still learning what's going on. You can see I'm using Smart SAS because I just really want to try and figure out the actual the launch characteristics of this. It is it's got quite a lot of a long burn time on it, um, and I need to not use any of the uh, the Red Maiden six A stage because that is our that's going to be our lunar um, basic stage. On the top there, you'll see our little tiny satellite that we're hoping is going to orbit the moon or at least hit it, and it is very much a a very small core it's very lightweight it's as light as we could strip it down it's got barely any science equipment on it um, it's basically using tiny rcs ports as its main propulsion system we don't have a proper engine on it um, because it's that small so there you go we've launched uh, we've changed over to our, our third stage now which is the old second stage of the, uh, the black arrow so this would be the gamma 2 um, and it is burning away nicely. It's not the prettiest stage in the world. I will admit that. I think it probably this is very much a, f a function over over a form over no a, star, a function over form approach. Um, but we're we're getting up there now. Obviously, the uh, the Black Arrow would have had a, a narrower 
stage at this point we've actually kept it the same width as the uh, as the previous stage um, and then you would have had the the sort of lipstick approach to the top that it's everybody's quite famous pictures of it, it looks very strange um, so we're burning up burning along there and again we're still using HTP as our main fuel the only thing being the Trident booster which uh, the first stage which is those those LR79 type engines, the well, the S3D type engines, the RZ1s, um, which are basically our first foray into liquid oxygen and kerosene. And that's, you know, it's something we're going to try and push forward with because it allows us scalability. But we are going to try and get an uprated uh, larger uh, HTP kerosene engine. We want to try and, you know, it's a very British thing, the, the HTP kerosene fuels. And I'd like to keep that going. So there's a couple of engines on on the way and there are a couple of mods out there that allow you to create engines and I think off the top of my head I can't remember what it was but there is one and I'll try and link it down there if not please ask me and I'll find the name of it that allows you to basically create your engines in KSP. Um, I will probably look at that and then bring them in with their own special models because we're going to use them over and over again um, and I'm not a big fan of particularly for the HTP RP1 engines uh, using the gamma sort of gamma 8 design model i don't, don't really like it because it's quite it's quite an, a, a chunky model shall we say it limits flexibility when the actual gamma engines themselves are actually quite sort of mobile you could mix them around and actually as as shown by the actual engines they were used on um they, they were mixed and matched quite nicely so we go around and we're basically one of the interesting things was, was trying to burn into the plane of the moon you can see we've actually got a decent um match of inclination but it is it is a bit it's it's not like playing normal kerbal you know it's not a you know fly into the equator equatorial plane and then you're sorted we actually have to do a bit, a bit of fiddling to keep it um so we're firing our uh, rcs and then we just light the main engine we're using the spectre engine again on this and it's uh, the most operated one we have and this burn just goes on it just it takes time it's just a matter of using all that now the interesting thing i found here was you know you need over 3000 meters per second to do this if this was kerbal it would be like 800 to go to mun which is it, it's, a, it's such a staggering order around could anyway back to this so the um the red maiden 6a is currently carrying the Pilgrim 1A Lunar Science Craft, and uh, you'll get a look at it in in, the, in 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 a little bit. But it's pretty much a a tube or a uh, a drum, and inside that drum we have basically some batteries, solar cells around the outside, um, a lot of HTP fuel, and we're going to use that to try try and capture. So, um, in an ideal world, I'd have actually put some extra batteries or solar panels onto the the red print the red maiden and allowed it to be our impactor however i'm more focused on just trying to get orbit because number one we need science at the moment we're actually lagging behind in science as to where i want to be um, but also um i want the money I and mean, you get more money for a flyby and then an orbit than you do for an impact so that's what we're, we're basically trying to do so you see here i'm trying to get it so that we're actually going in a set direction around the moon and what i want to do is actually drop it so the periaps is just inside the moon because i want the booster to hit um because i'm basically testing the, the the system and seeing if i can actually trick it to give me a contract that it maybe shouldn't um, so there you go now you get a final look at the pilgrim and this is this is going to be the, the pilgrim 1a we're going to have a, a hopefully if this works a couple of pilgrim craft because i want to send i think there's probably about three or four contracts we're going to try and send a few of them to them to the moon we want to go equatorial orbit we want to ideally go polar orbit as well now obviously it takes around seven days for this to actually get to the moon so this is where kerbal alarm clock kicks in um however this was my first trip with this save setup and everything i haven't actually uh, used this setup before to go with this sort of distance and i haven't used cover alarm clock to actually stop uh things and um well it didn't go quite to plan let me put it that way um cover alarm clock didn't quite waken itself up until we'd gone a little bit further than we probably should have and there you go we've actually jumped through the spear room once and started to go past the moon uh, so i frantically at this point point the craft any way I can because I just need to slow down I've got a I, I don't even know if I think I've got the fly past I think we get the fly past on this but I just trying frantically to actually get it to to fire its engines now 
in reality, I actually think this is pretty accurate because one thing I did not note about this craft was the control core on board is not quite right. It is a near earth control core and I don't believe it should actually work around the moon. Although it seems to be at this point, and I think it's probably a, a glitch to do with a combination of MechJeb and the fact that I'm using RCS instead of main engines or anything like that, and I'm not actually reorientating the craft. If you actually look at it, it is not reorientating. I'm not aiming, I'm just firing against my, my direction of travel because this craft has an RCS port on the front and the back. So we're going to go into a rough, a really rough orbit. So I think I'm gonna let myself have that, but I'm gonna say, you know what? Because the systems were just so overloaded, that's why we went past the moon. It was just too much stuff, couldn't figure out what was going on, and that's what's gonna happen. Um, so what's that tell us? Well, it tells us that actually the next time we do this, we need to actually upgrade the uh, the Pilgrim a little bit. Um, primarily, we need to change that core out. We need to put in a deep space core to give us some control and also hopefully some ability to hibernate, although I'm not sure we have the tech for that. Now, what I will say is that I believe we'd only just, we're only just about to unlock the actual uh, the actual cores, the deep space cores. So this was part of the reason why I rushed this craft, because of course we're, we're racing the USSR and, and the U USA at the moment. So, you know, difficult, um, but we'll see. So the, the 1A is still, we're gonna try and get it to a situation where it can actually complete some missions for us. So hopefully get into some sort of orbit. You can see, I think it's gonna potentially achieve some sort of orbit but it's not going to be anything that'd be great for us so we're probably going to have to repeat this mission i'm hoping that we're going to get some sort of completion reward for it um but this is a lot better than the russians in in, in your timeline where they actually uh, they actually missed the moon if i remember rightly and, and end up in interplanetary space but they haven't got that far here yet so we'll we'll talk about that later um and you see that we're just uh doing some final changes and uh we get a bit of a flyby so we get the flyby contract just because we get close enough but we we don't have the ability to fix this orbit very well at all it's pretty much dead in the water now you can see that the control core is pretty much dead we have electricity we just can't really communicate it's finally realized that it's not good for it anyway so we're going to leave that there we're going to have to build another one and try again it is now the first of june 19 now 58 and while we wait for that new Pilgrim to be built, we're going to do a supersonic contract um, with a flight from uh, Spirit Adams in the UK. So we're going to fly the White Signal 2A. Uh, it's It's been upgraded to the 2B. Uh, we've upgraded its Avon engines to the Mark 141s, which are actually from about 1954, 1955, if I remember rightly. Uh, it's still not the final version, but it's a little bit more powerful than we have had so far. Uh, this was actually the first military, I think it was the first military designation engines. They were also re designated the RAS-7s. Um, so we're aiming for a top speed of 475 meters per second um, at a decent altitude, as you've seen before. And we're going to have Kim Jarvis yet again, because she's the only person there, to actually fly it. Um, she brings it up to the right height, accelerates as fast as she can, it's very noisy, obviously, and um, we don't want to use the engines at this full power for too long. She takes it over the speed limit that it needs to be and just keeps going, really, because she can. Um, she gets it well up to, uh, to you know, completes the mission well over 530 meters per second. Um, and it's just an easy flight. This craft finds this speed between four and 500 really easy. I'm concerned it won't go any faster than that, but we'll see. Maybe bigger engines will help. So she turns it around on a dime very nice look at that beautiful and uh, she's gonna bring it back down um, but you know what let's see how fast she can go coming back because we've lost fuel so let's see if we can get it any faster so we're gonna aim for I think about 550 meters per second um, just because number one I want to get back to land quickly and land the craft nice and safely as easy as possible but also I want to see how fast it can go so we're, we're hammering it now as we come through the atmosphere and yeah, we, we exceed 550 at about 10 kilometers in altitude, uh, but it's I, I don't see it going over t over 600. I think we'd have to push it um, uh, to really get that. Um, 
and that is another successful flight for Kim Jarvis. Um, so as she brings it into land, we're going to end it there. We are in the middle of 1958. We're gone to the moon. Everybody else is starting to get into orbit. So things are starting to get packed up there. So we need to keep moving forward. And uh, yeah, this, this is going to get competitive. So uh, until next time, have a great one.